Leading a droid army against the Republic can be hard work, so whether you're new to Empire War Expanded Fall of the Republic in 1.2, want a better understanding of the faction to play as or against it, or simply need something to have on in the background while doing dishes in today's faction guide, we're going to be breaking down the entire roster of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, their factional mechanics, an overview of their heroes, as well as giving some tips on how to succeed when playing as them on the galactic map. Before we get to the specific units, we'll talk a little bit about fleet doctrine compared to the Republic. There are of course a lot of ways to approach the game and what you are facing is incredibly important for planning a specific fleet. But to get you started on the right foot with a basic standard fleet, often the CIS fleets are going to be built around having a core battlecruiser like a Lucrahulk or the Subjugator as a focal point, while some other less durable damage dealers support it, like the Munificent and Recusant. The primary CIS fighters and bombers, the Vulture and Hyena, are also classified as swarm units, which means in game, they take up half the slots of other fighters. So if a unit's info card says that it has one squadron, that would actually mean two squadrons if they're Vultures or Hyenas. This means the CIS will often have a numerical advantage, if not an advantage in quality. Some of your options will also change as you progress through the eras or research, which we'll cover on a per ship basis. Though if you'd like more information on the era system itself, there's also a beginner's guide to follow the Republic as a whole, which I will link in the description. On top of more standard gameplay modes, there's also the from the ground up era 1 game mode, which has a more limited pre-Clone Wars unit roster. But since that's a single era in what's usually considered a challenge mode, I'll leave that out of the general descriptions of unit availability here. The Luger Hulk is probably the main battlecruiser you'll come across when playing both as and against the CIS. There are three primary distinctions between Luger Hulk classes. The cargo or auxiliary Luger Hulk, the battle carrier, and the battleship. All three levels of Luger Hulk have significant fighter loadouts and reasonable damage. Though as you can probably guess, the battle carrier has more of a focus on the fighters and less on the damage, while the battle cruiser is set up more for direct engagements in both damage and health. The cargo Lucre Hulk has the same fighters, hull, and shield strength as the battle carrier, but about half the damage of it. Keep in mind that in Fall of the Republic, all unit costs and pop caps are calculated on the same basis, so you're primarily going to want to figure out what distribution of stats, roll, or damage types you want for a particular engagement based on what you're fighting rather than simply looking for which unit is straight up better for the cost. For example, while the cargo ship is the weakest of the three, it takes up about half the population capacity of the battle cruiser, while not being a particularly worse tank. So when building a fleet with some more glass cannon units, a cargo or carrier Lucre Hulk can often be an effective centerpiece, and in some cases better to use than the battle cruiser. The battle carrier is available throughout the game, whereas the battle cruiser only unlocks once you hit era 3, and the cargo Lucre Hulk is primarily only in starting forces. While Lucre Hulks do have a lot of firepower in their lasers and turbo lasers, making them good at protecting themselves against both other frigates and fighters on top of their fighter complements, their firing arc is split in all directions around its hull. If a Lucre Hulk is surrounded, it can hit many targets at once and make the most out of its considerable DPS. But if it's only firing in one direction, it will only get a fraction of that damage out and can easily be overwhelmed by a concentrated directional assault. Typically, battle cruisers are very vulnerable to fighters, but the fact that it does have so many of its own fighters and lasers means that it's usually an exception to this. By positioning them farther up, even in the middle of an enemy fleet, you'll get the most out of their damage arcs while also letting them tank for other weaker units that are placed further in your back line. Their weapon types also vary between heavy and medium depending on the Lucre Hulk type. A light weapon has shorter range but better accuracy against smaller targets, while a heavy weapon has longer range but is generally far less capable of hitting the smaller targets. So keep that in mind when doing your target selection for individual ships, and keep an eye on armaments in the info cards. For the most part, you should be able to get by with a broad level understanding of bomb the big stuff, use heavies against the other big stuff, and light weapons against smaller stuff. But if you're interested in diving more deeply into the very in-depth combat mechanics and modifiers, there are further in-game guides on exactly how unit stats and classes work, and the buttons on the left side of the screen in the galactic mode, all of which we covered in a bit more depth in the overall mod guide. Beyond these three tiers of Lucre Hulk, the cargo and battle carrier Lucre Hulks have another variant, the droid control ship type. These provide some extra fighter healing in an area and a small command bonus on top of their other regular capabilities, 
but they are not standard buildable units. Instead, you'll find them as hero flagships or the occasional starting force in certain scenarios. So make sure you check the info card of heroes so you can see exactly what you're going to have to work with. Staying on the battlecruiser end, if you want to sacrifice some of that fighter focus and the distributed firing arcs for more targeted and concentrated weapon damage while keeping the tankiness, the CIS also has the Subjugator class, which people may know from General Grievous's flagship, the Malevolence. If the Lucra Hulk wants to be deployed in the middle of a group of smaller ships, the Subjugator's main strength comes in its ability to use its two special ion weapons to disable a target entirely. These can easily strip even the shields of a Victory or Venator and shut it down in a single shot, and its concentrated single target damage and ion disabling capabilities make it ideal for facing down an enemy Praetor or Mandator, or even just assaulting high level defensive stations. Keeping it a bit further back than you would a Lucre Hulk can allow it to get the most out of its weapons without putting it at too much risk. A Lucre Hulk's fighter loadout can help in dealing with large ships as well, but if you want the more guaranteed one-on-one -on -one dueling, the Subjugator is where you should look. Its relatively meager fighter complement does mean that where the Luger Hulk is a carrying and anti-fighter beast into itself, the Subjugator should be deployed with more carriers and supporting anti-fighter like the Diamond class, though its light turbo lasers do allow it to effectively target enemy light frigates, even if the ion weapons are less useful against groups of smaller ships than against individual larger targets. Like the Luger Hulk, while it's expensive, the Subjugator can be built in any era from a level 4 shipyard, and Grievous can be upgraded to command the Malevolence itself, which will talk about in a bit. Because carriers are so core to the CIS, we'll cover them next. Carrier, as a role in Empire or Expanded, specifically refers to any unit which has a complement of bombers, not just fighters. There are several ships which have fighter complements but no bombers, which are not considered carriers for gameplay terms here. We've already covered the Lucrahawk carriers, but there are four other carriers at different size tiers. Their smallest carrier is the C9979, a variant on the landing ship used in Episode 1 on Naboo. Their individual stats are fairly low, so you're getting basically three quarters of the credit in population cost in its considerable fighter capacity, in the form of swarm vultures and hyenas. It does have some lasers on its own, including rapid fire lasers, allowing it to shoot down both enemy fighters and enemy munitions in limited but still helpful capacities. This focus makes it perfect to pair with the Subjugator to make up for its own lack of fighters, even if you're not planning to go super fighter heavy and instead just want to keep the Republic from attaining fighter superiority themselves. Going up a bit in size, we have the Captor class. These have a bit more power invested in the ship's own stats, bringing light turbo lasers and concussion missiles to the table. They give up the swarm hyena bombers for the Belbalab 24 bombers. You'll still want to avoid trying to duel other frigates with the captor, but its light turbo lasers make it great for taking out anti-fighter corvettes which may threaten its precious fighter babies. There are two capital level carriers for the CIS, the first of which is the DH Omni. While it does serve as a carrier, most of its power is in its fleet support abilities. It's a fleet tender, meaning it passively heals ships around it, along with a deployable burst heal for fighters, and it has the ability to deploy interdiction mines to prevent enemy retreats. It's reasonably tanky, though it only has a limited medium laser loadout, so you don't want to rely on them for damage. Pairing one or two of them with a group of small frigates is where they'll get best results, allowing the smaller ships to heal tank while putting out significant amounts of damage. They're somewhat less useful when paired with Lucre Hawks or Subjugators because larger ships with hard points don't benefit as much from the healing unless you're over a world with a hypervelocity gun, where some of the hard points that are damaged but not destroyed might get healed by the DH Omni between shots, keeping it alive for longer. Finally, we have the Providence class carrier slash destroyer, which is something of a CIS counterpart to the Venator, with a more physical and ion damage focus available at all eras. It has a considerable fighter complement of its own, including heavy bombers, along with an array of light turbo lasers, regular lasers, proton torpedoes, and even heavy ion cannons, making it solidly able to contribute in any fleet loadout, though you'll want to surround it with more specialized ships based on the tasks at hand. Among the other capital ships of the CIS, we have the Bulwark 1 and Bulwark 2. These become available through research starting early in Era 3, with the Bulwark 1 research leading into the Bulwark 2 research. Like the victory of the Republic side, these are meant for dedicated ship-to-ship -ship combat. The Bulwark 1 is a similar size to the Providence Inventor, though somewhat beefier and higher damage, at the expense of the versatility that comes with the Providence's more varied loadout and considerable fighters. It has both heavy ions and heavy turbo lasers, making it great at hitting stations and larger enemy ships, but it's especially vulnerable to fighters and bombers, and far less equipped to deal with smaller frigates. The Bulwark 2 is similar, though scaled up to 1700 meters, with 
with all the strengths and weaknesses that come along with that. Keep both of them away from carrier focus fleets unless you have fighter and anti-fighter support from C9979s and Diamond or from other carriers and anti-fighter units. The CIS's main frigate roster is geared towards damage output rather than being particularly defensive, with the Auxilia, Recusant, and Munificent filling this range. Munificent has heavy ions and ultra-heavy turbolasers, allowing it to engage at extreme ranges, along with light turbolasers and lasers, allowing it to take out some smaller frigates more reliably when up close. But it's very flimsy, and with its clustered hardpoints, area of effect damage from bombs or missiles can take them out quite quickly if not protected. It's especially important to keep anti-fighter units like the Diamond around the Munificent so that they can shoot down incoming missiles. If you can keep several of them safe though, they can quickly rip through most targets. The Recusant has a bit less range without the Ultra Heavies of the Munificent, and is worse at taking down shields, specifically without the Ions, though that helps more of its weapon loadout be helpful regardless of the target type, and it has quite a bit more bulk to protect it from attacks, though it still wants to be positioned similarly to the Munificent, behind a tankier ship like the Lugerhawk. It does have a broader array of lasers, which means it can protect both itself and other ships in your backline from small bomber forces which may slip by. Where the Recusant and Munificent are better equipped to help take out some of the larger enemy ships, the Auxilia has a mix of light turbo lasers, ions, and concussion missiles, making it more of a corvette hunter. While none of these three have any fighters by default, the CIS can research the hull latching tack from their political options menu, giving Recusants and Munificents a few fighters. On the corvette and small frigate end, the CIS has the Diamond, Kolovex, Munifex, and Hardcell. Diamonds are one of the best anti-fighter ships in the game, with a plethora of anti-fighter rapid lasers, meaning they can shoot down plenty of enemy missiles and bombs with point defense on top of tearing through enemy fighter craft. The Kolovex similarly has a ton of point defense, but on top of its slightly reduced anti-fighter capabilities, it has some light turbo lasers. The Munifex, on the other hand, has light turbos and light ions, making the Munifex and Kolovex pairs great for taking down small frigates when working in tandem. The Hard Cell has some medium lasers and assault concussion missile launchers, making groups of them great for assaulting enemy frigates and capital ships when in groups. Pairing groups of each of these with a the DH Omni can allow you to put out a surprising amount of consistent damage against pretty much any threat, while mitigating enemy bombers and physical munition damage, and being much harder to hit than a single large capital ship. With Hard Cells in particular, if you're fighting a much larger ship that's equipped with a bunch of heavy weapons, it's not going to be able to hit something like a hard cell very reliably, while the hard cells are going to be able to do a ton of damage to it. The CIS can additionally build small squadrons of Gozanti gunships which have a mix of fighter lasers and proton torpedoes, making them useful for killing both enemy fighters and attacking capital ships in certain situations. Like with the last guides, I strongly encourage people to try out fleets involving more use of these small ships if you don't do it already. The results will probably surprise you, particularly if you have a fleet tenor to support them. Beyond these core roster options, there are two further ships available in specific circumstances to the CIS, the Recusant and Providence Dreadnought variants. These both perform similar roles to their smaller counterparts, but in a scaled up and more powerful form. The Recusant trades up from its medium weapons for some heavier and ultra heavy weaponry, making it a huge threat at very long ranges while the Providence trades the light protons for assault concussion missile launchers and ultra-heavy ions, meaning both are great for taking even larger targets than before, though a bit worse against smaller ones. These are currently only available as hero flagships like Trench's Providence and Grievous's Recusant, and in some random spawns, but they will also become available as mission rewards and in some other places if you're watching this in a future version beyond 1.2. On the ground, because of all the droids, it's a bit harder to divide the CIS roster into a clear infantry and vehicle distinction. On the clearly infantry side, they have the B1 and B2 battle droids, as well as the BX Commando. B1 battle droids come in massive companies of 112, compared to the typical 30 to 40 of other infantry types, but their loadout is all a standard carbine, and the individual stats are quite low. Concentrated fire from them can still be very overwhelming, and they can keep enemies busy for quite some time, while also having the option to split up and hit multiple capturable objectives at once. The B2 has a more varied armament and significantly better stats per individual droid, though they come in much smaller companies. All B2s have their regular rifle ammunition as well as wrist rockets, and each of the four squads in the company has an additional heavy anti-tank droid and a droid with a heavy repeater attachment, making them effective against both infantry and enemy vehicles. Pairing a company of B1s with B2s for a mix of map control, meat shields, and dedicated firepower can lead to some pretty good results. 
BX Commandos are primarily anti-infantry with snipers allowing them to hit clones at range, and they're very mobile between their base speed and sprint ability. Unlike the Republic, none of the basic infantry are able to use the Take Cover ability, though the Super Battle Droid health and BX Commando mobility typically makes up for that. Because of weirdness with how EAW's categories works and limitations to how many categories we have, Currently, you can only heal infantry with back to tanks, which looks a bit weird with droids, but keep that in mind when you're deciding what to build on build pads. You also have the STAP for even more mobile anti-infantry capabilities, though without the grenades in territory capturing of commandos. STAPs are particularly great against Jedi heroes in a way that other infantry are not. Keep in mind when engaging Jedi that infantry fire will be absorbed or reflected by a Jedi hero, so avoid using infantry to take them down and instead hit them with some snaps. Next, we have a category of droids falling somewhere between infantry and light vehicles. Crabs, dwarf spider droids, and the droidica. Crabs and dwarf spider droids come in four squads of four, while droidica are individually controlled. The shields and mobility of droidica make them incredibly good at taking out enemy infantry and moving between positions, though if caught before deploying, they will die easily meaning you want to try to set them up before walking them in for that final engagement. In Era 4, the Droidica Mark II unlocks, which improves both the health and blaster damage of the Droidica, while also adding ion cannons for further disruption. There are fewer per company of the Droidica Mark II, so if you're using them for mass infantry control, you might want to stick with the Mark I, since the Mark I doesn't lock when the Mark II unlocks. The Droidica II is also only available from Hypori. Crab droids are generally more durable anti-infantry damage than droidica, though slightly less mobile, while dwarf spider droids are great at anti-vehicle damage. Pairing dwarf spider droids in particular with B1 companies can help shore up the lack of B1 anti-vehicle capabilities without giving up your numerical advantage. Much like in space, if you have a proper mixed force and don't shy away from smaller or more numerous units in favor of just using as many of whatever's biggest as possible, you'll have a far better time with ground battles. Large units do have a place, but they shouldn't be the only thing you use. There are fewer dedicated infantry support options for the CIS than Republic, with the ATTE, LAAT, and ATOT, but there are still two vehicles built around that, the PAC and the MTT. The PAC is a small skiff with several units per company and a pretty massive carrying capacity, which allows you to ferry even large groups of infantry around, even over water. The MTT, on the other hand, lacks the carrying capacity, but can deploy squads of battle droid with no lifetime limit. Keep an eye on the info card and icons under your infantry to see exactly what they're armed with, as the battle droids in this squad have better and more varied armaments than standard B1s do. It's also quite tanky on its own and can put out good damage over time with its anti-vehicle blasters. The CIS then has six light to medium vehicles. The lightest of these is the homing spider droid, which isn't the fastest but has an anti-vehicle beam and heavy area of effect anti-infantry blasters, making them fantastic at hitting infantry while still contributing a bit against vehicles. Their anti-vehicle damage is actually quite high, it's just without the added maneuverability of other things like the hail fires, their low health can make them quite vulnerable. The Persuader or Snail Tank is more explicitly anti-vehicle, with its primary armament being an anti-vehicle blaster though it can also run over infantry and has concussion grenades as well. The HAML is a dedicated anti-air unit, though it also can help against infantry or light vehicles with its flak pods. You don't want to engage heavy vehicles at all with it. The Hailfire Droid is quite fast and able to hit infantry, vehicles, or even structures very hard with its missile barrages. Then it can quickly retreat when it gets dangerous. But if they're caught in a direct engagement, they will fold pretty quickly. Massed Hailfire Droids can do a ton of damage, but you do need to be careful with when and how you send them in. Finally are the AAT and GAT. The AAT has a heavy laser and light proton missiles, while the GAT has those swap. Both are able to traverse water, but while the AAT has slightly higher health, the GAT has shields, which allows it to kite in and out of a battle without taking as much actual damage. The GAT is far more maneuverable and has more of its damage oriented towards anti-vehicle, while the AAT has a few additional anti-infantry blasters. Most of these vehicles are available throughout the war, but the GAT locks after Era 3 starts. There are two artillery options for the CIS, the AJG and the J1 Proton Cannon. The HAG has indirect lobbed Air of Effect thermal warheads, able to shoot in a massive range across significant portions of any given map. The J1 is a direct fire artillery piece, firing a heavy mass driver at about half the range but twice as often, making it great for hitting enemy vehicles, though less effective against infantry, and does require uninterrupted line of sight. Both can actually be quite good for taking on turbo laser emplacements, for example, but the J1 is less effectively able to hit into an enemy base from afar. 
In the air, the CIS does not have any speeders but does have two gunship options. The MAF, which is always available, and the HMP, which unlocks an Era 4. They each have a variety of different blasters and missiles, so they can be used effectively against almost any target. But while the MAF has overall more stats, the HMP instead comes in companies of two, and has some shields and higher speed, making them more effective for hit and run strikes across the map compared to the more mainline assault and infantry support focus of the MAF with its carrying capacity. There there are two final heavy vehicle options to cover with the CIS, the Octoptara and the Protodeca. The Octoptara, or Magnetridroid, is your heaviest regular vehicle with a decent health pool and a relatively high range light mass driver for taking down enemy vehicles and structures. It struggles quite a bit against infantry and is quite cumbersome, but it can shoot in any direction with its constantly rotating head. Make sure when you use an Octoptara that you pair it with some battle droids or crab droids to handle enemy infantry before it can threaten it, and also that you don't advance them too far past where it's safe as they won't be able to escape very easily. The Protodeca, a rare two-population unit which is only attainable through missions you'll be offered throughout a Galactic Conquest game, is a massive weapons platform with a huge health pool, proton missiles, and giant anti-vehicle turbolasers. As a hover vehicle, it's able to traverse more varied terrain than the A6 Juggernaut of the Republic, though it has less weapon variety and can't shoot behind itself like the Juggernaut can. Like the Octoptara though, if you have a sustained advance with it, it can wreck whatever comes at it, but if it gets flanked, it's going to be in more trouble. For the heroes of the CIS, while they don't have quite the same variety or ability to replace dead heroes that the Republic Command Staff has, there are some CIS heroes that are able to come back from the dead themselves. Admiral Trench will respawn soon after his first death in largely the same form. If Dirge the Bounty Hunter dies, he has a chance to respawn which decreases with every subsequent death. General Grievous was famous for getting out of tricky situations, so he has an upgrade and downgrade system based on his flagships. He has four possible flagships across three tiers. The lowest tier is the Munificent, which can upgrade into the second tier, being either his Providence Invisible Hand or the Recusant Dreadnought Renator, and then from either of those, he can upgrade to the Malevolence. If he dies while commanding one of them, he drops to the next level down, only dying for good if he is killed while in the Munificent form. Beyond that, there are a variety of admirals, ground commanders, and even Dooku and a few other Dark Jedi to wipe out the armies of the Republic with. If you do happen to lose two of Dooku, Trench, and Duaningo, there is a CIS holdouts event which will happen and give you two new heroes, including Jizor Delso. The main government mechanics of the CIS are based on building a tighter coalition with its constituent companies. Companies, the Trade Federation, Techno Union, Commerce Guild, and Banking Clan, each of which acts as an independent faction on the galactic map, and all of which are indicated by a faction symbol under the planet to show who they're allied with. While you can't place units on their planets directly, you are able to move past any of these corporations' worlds to get to your other territory or to attack the Republic. As you complete missions or purchase increased loyalty with the corporations, you'll increase your influence with them. Each influence gain or completed mission will cause one of their worlds to directly join your faction, and once you reach 100 influence, any remaining worlds belonging to that faction will join entirely, as well as giving new heroes. To see the opinion of any of the sub-factions at any time, you can check the government display by clicking on the centered icon from the galactic level. As with the Republic Guide, we'll be looking at the Clone Wars progressive map in Era 2, the default starting era, as our example for some tips on how to start out your campaigns, though the principles we cover here should generally apply everywhere. On top of the divisions with the corporate faction territory, your territory is divided into a couple sections as well, with the advantage of being able to travel through the allied territory to get between them. You have a cluster of planets in the north, as well as in the south, and a few stragglers towards the core. Start by picking which area you want to bolster most, and go from there. Plan on which factions you want to integrate accordingly. Sometimes it's worth it to decide you're not going to build up or protect a particular world because you think you'll be able to get back to it later, or because you don't want to use those resources which you could better spend elsewhere. If you decide you can't hold the core worlds, for example, use those resources to bolster the worlds on the outer rim, and don't overwhelm yourself by trying to focus on too many things at once. If you integrate the sub-factions that are close to you, then you'll have have additional resources to pool together for your initial campaigns, but if you want to open up new fronts with the enemy, integrating some of the farther away sub-factions from where you plan to mostly focus could get you resources that you'll otherwise lose, while you're still expanding in a way that will keep the ones close to you safe. 
there are advantages and disadvantages to either method. In the north, taking planets like Quell and Renvar and even Roche can limit some of the Republic's production early while keeping Mon Calamari out of the war for them, even if you hold out on actually attacking Mon Calamari for some time. In the south, Camino and Rathana are nearby, and with an influx of units from integrating powerful Techno-Union shipyard worlds like Forost, Fondor, and Hypori, you could be able to set yourself up for a final assault into the core or an early assault on Camino and Rathana. Generally, just don't be afraid to let the sub-factions take some of the heat for you early on. Even if it means the Republic is able to take a few worlds, it should give you more time to secure your own borders. There are some important AI worlds like Coruscant which will have additional defensive forces that you can see on the galactic map, but which will not be used to attack you. So it can be quite difficult to take some of these worlds, but if you can whittle them down over successive assaults, you should be able to take the world and they won't replenish those defensive forces. That's it for our guide to the Confederacy of Independent Systems. If you found it helpful, please leave a like or subscribe for more. I plan to do one of these guides for every faction in Thrawn's Revenge as well, and for any future factions in Fall of the Republic. If you want to see more direct usage of everything, or see what's in store for the mod in general, you can check out the previews I also do on this channel. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.